talked about some of the theories of intelligence, let's talk about how we actually go in and measure intelligence. There's been lots of companies and lots of people that have measured intelligence and lots of different types of intelligence tests you can access. But the very first was by Alfred Binet. And Alfred Binet was in France and he was making a test to try and determine which kids were more likely to be at risk of falling behind in school. This original test was not meant to be testing a biologically driven static trait that would never change. Oftentimes we think about that when we think about IQ tests. He actually believed that intelligence was highly changeable. And he believed the purpose of his test was to identify the kids that maybe came from families that didn't have the ability to expose them to some things so that, that, he could, so that those kids could get extra help in school. Start off with really noble causes here. The idea that socioeconomic status or family income might influence the grades, or so identifying the kids that could use just a little bit extra teacher help. Of course, Binet eventually left France and went to uh, Stanford University where he met Theodore Simon, and it's the idea that now we use the Stanford Binet, which was revised at Stanford University. The Binet tests tend to look at intelligence as one unique trait, so more akin to experiments G, but nowadays we, tend to, we do tend to see some different subscales, verbal intelligence or nonverbal intelligence or whatnot, and it tends to look at things like our judgment, our attention, our reasoning, very much analytical rather than creative intelligence, but we tend to focus on the single score that comes out at the end rather than the scores associated with different shades. And the purpose of this originally was to see these skills that we intended to see improvement throughout the ages. So that's how it started. It's very different from where it ended up, of course. So in the very first test, when we looked at the scoring, we had what was known as the original formula. We're going to go over the original formula, but it's important to understand we have since moved away from that and we do do different things in today's modern intelligence tests. The reason why intelligence is often referred to as our IQ is it means our intelligence quotient. If you think about math, in addition, we get a sum. In subtraction, we get a difference. In multiplication, we get a product. And in division, we get a quotient. And so the quotient is the answer you get in a division formula. And the original division formula was when we divided mental age over chronological age. So what happened here is Binet went and worked with kids and found a lot of cognitive tasks that the average five-year-old can do, the average six-year-old can do, the average seven-year-old could do, and so on and so forth. And then based on knowing what tasks an average kid of the age could do, he could understand how to identify one's mental age. If a child could do the mental tasks commonly associated with a seven-year-old, but couldn't do some of the tasks associated with an eight-year-olds, they were considered to have a mental age of seven. And so you would take the mental age and put it on the top part of the division formula and take the child's chronological age, this is how many years they've been alive, and you put that on the bottom of the formula. Now, if one's mental and chronological age match, they will end up with an IQ of 100. So by default, the IQ, an average IQ, will have a score of 100. If the mental age is lower than the chronological age, they're going to have an IQ of less than 100. And if the mental age is higher than the chronological age, they're going to have an IQ of higher than 100. So this allowed for us to sort of not have to worry about the child's age, not have to worry about the details, just look at this one quotient and get a snapshot if they're behind or if they're ahead. And the kids with IQs of less than 100 are the ones that needed extra help. So this also allowed us to compare across ages. We could see if a child continued to be behind or if they were starting to catch up or if they continued to be ahead. In this way, a four-year-old with a mental age of five and an eight-year-old with a mental age of 10 are both considered to have an IQ of 125. It's one number we can use to compare across siblings of different ages or to compare across one child across the different ages. So this was originally used. This has since been abandoned for lots of other complex reasons, but what we've substituted it for is looking at standard deviations and standard scores. So today in modern intelligence tests, what often happens is we have a raw score. Let's say the test is out of 60 possible questions and you get 54 questions right. Well, that's your raw score. Then at the back of the intelligence book or sometimes on the intelligence software, we have these tables, these charts. And we look under these tables and charts and we see that under the column for your age and we look for a score of 54, we compare it and it tells us what the standardized score is. How do we get these charts? Well, what happens now is instead of Binet going and testing a few kids of each age, we do norming. 
This is the idea that we test thousands of people before an intelligence test is released. And we test them based on their age, based on the grade level, based on uh, if they have any learning disabilities, for instance, and we get these normalized charts. And so that lets us know if we're testing based on grade level or how many months a person's been in school or we're testing on chronological age, we can compare and see where they are. Some really basic intelligence tests are the idea that you just simply look up based on the age and once you get to be an adult, it'd be larger brackets like an adult in their 30s or an adult in their 40s. And if an adult in their 40s gets a 54 at a 60, that might be average or above average or below average depending on the test. And that'll tell us what the standardized score is. Whatever the average was for that group, for that norm group, uh, the average will be equivalent to a standardized score of 100. Above average is equivalent to a score above 100, and below average is equivalent to a score below 100. And we tend to curve these standardized scores in such a way that we make it so 70%, or 68.2% rather, will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. About 95.4% will fall within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of people will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. Because of this, in true science-based IQ tests, it's very rare for us to find someone who has an IQ above 145, because it's going to be 0.3% of the population, which is pretty tiny. And so if you've ever taken an online IQ test and you and all your friends and family members who took it all had an IQ of 150, there was probably something suspicious going on with that test. And that's because reputable tests, we tend to see the normal curve. Now it's possible that you run in a circle of geniuses, didn't say it, it's not possible, but it's unlikely. So we moved away from the original quotient formula and now we use these standardized norms. The problem with some of our IQ tests, as you may have imagined, is some of the questions on them may not be the best types of questions. And so when we're trying to design an IQ test, we have to be very careful that we're paying attention to the notions of reliability and to validity. And so reliability and validity work together to make sure we hit our target. Reliability is the idea that if you're testing something that shouldn't change dramatically over a short period of time, that if you continue to test them or test them in a similar way, the score should be similar time after time after time. Validity is the idea that when you think you're measuring something, you're actually measuring what you're measuring. So let me explain. Reliability can be different depending on what you're testing. If you're testing mood, moods fluctuate. If you're testing appetite, appetite fluctuates. But if you're testing something like personality, that doesn't fluctuate day to day usually. And what we have found, despite Binet's earlier inclination, is that the way we test intelligence tends to be pretty stable. So IQ testing should be somewhat reliable over time. Yes, people can grow and yes, people can uh, change, but not in really exceptional ways over short periods of time. There usually has to be something very intense going on. And so when we look to reliability, one type of reliability we look for is test-retest reliability. If you test someone in grade five and you test them in grade six, you wouldn't expect them to go from really advanced to really behind, or really behind to really advanced in that short of time, unless something significant happened in their life. We also have what's known as parallel forms. In a lot of intelligence tests today, we have form A and form B. They're considered to be equally as difficult, but we tend to only give participants one of these forms at a time, so if they need to be retested again, we're not using the exact same questions, but we're using a test of equal difficulty. And if you test them on the two forms, the two forms should reveal an equal score, should be pretty identical. We can also do this if we use split half reliability. That's the idea if you split the questions in an intelligence test, compare the score on just the odd number questions to just the score on the even questions, they should have roughly the same score. This is letting us know that the intelligence test was pretty strongly constructed. This is something we need to consider when we consider a lot of different types of aptitude and achievement tests as well. Then we have validity. Validity is the idea that you're testing what you think you're testing. And this is really tricky when it comes to intelligence. If you're testing intelligence in young kids that may not have learned to read yet, but you want to test things aside from their literacy, you want to make sure that the test does not depend on them having good reading comprehension. Otherwise, then you're not getting at some of their other types of intelligence. You also want to make sure your intelligence test is not too sensitive to their mood. If a kid is really anxious or really distracted on that day, they might not perform at their best, and that might show them as having a lower intelligence than they truly have. And we have to be really careful that what we're testing is not their family's income or their ability to access tutors or private mentoring. 
that can be especially problematic because it can overinflate the intelligence of some kids and really compromise the scores of other kids.